two, one. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Neil Lowenstein, um, a attorney and partner with Van Deventer Black, uh, headquartered in Norfolk, Virginia, with uh, uh, offices in Richmond and also in North Carolina. Um, I am happy to have with me my partner and colleague, Ann Bebo, who is the chair of our employment labor law practice group and is uh, very well versed not just in labor and employment law but the new regulations that we're going to be talking about today that Virginia has put in place. Um, we both uh, want to thank Stephanie Rogers and the Haruka board for allowing us to provide this presentation for everybody. As you guys know we are going to be talking about Virginia's new emergency temporary standards regarding infectious disease prevention. Um, the word temporary is in there. Uh, however, um, we'll talk about this a bit more. Um, the Department of Labor has already made um, a move to make these regulations permanent. So in all likelihood, they are here to stay absent some other things um, changing that are unexpected. Um, we're gonna give you the big picture overview uh, of, of the regulations as part of this. Um, talk a little bit about where they came from, um, what they entail, uh, and then highlight some of the, the particular aspects of them that folks have been asking us about. Uh, along the way. Um, this is, as you all know, a Microsoft Teams live event. Um, we're using the Microsoft platform for that. And one of the nice things about it is that it has um, available to you a question and answer um, chat, so to speak, that you can go into, um, type in your questions and we will see them live as you're typing them in. Some of them we may respond back, others we may wait and talk about them either within other aspects of the presentation as we go, or we also will have a Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. So um, we do expect to be able to get to everybody's questions, but if for some reason we don't, we will uh, certainly review them and get responses back either directly to anybody asking them or to Stephanie to uh, to publish them to everybody. Um, let's see. Well, uh, this and this is just sort of background. It's it's the, this is one of the things that our firm is doing, trying to keep up with the COVID um, mess, so to speak. Uh, and um, you know, there's a lot more information that is also available on our website about it. Uh, before we get going, Stephanie, did you want to say anything? Uh, yes, Neil, I want to first of all um, thank all of our members and any guests uh, for joining us today and um, also to thank your team as well, uh, Neil, for doing this for us. I think it's important that we stay on top of this and um, and I hope everyone, you know, if they got any questions whatsoever, you know, definitely volunteer to ask those so we can uh, clear up any questions about this and hopefully get through this together. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Well, we'll uh, we'll get rolling then. Um, next slide, please. And next slide. So a little bit about the people presenting. Um, many of the group I've, I've met before, been a member of Haruka. Uh, wow, um, been practicing law for nearly 30 years, and I think I've been a member um, with Haruka almost throughout. Um, uh, held a few different positions, been on the legislative committee in the past, and um, also am working with Stephanie, uh, have been on some legislative things. Um, more recently. 
Uh, my background and practice is primarily construction, government contracts work, and pretty much all aspects of it from soup to nuts. Um, now, next slide, introduce, let Ann introduce herself. So this is me. I'm, um, as Neil said, I'm head of the uh, firm's labor and employment law practice. I advise employers on a routine basis regarding all aspects of employment law and labor law as well. And I also am the chair of the firm's litigation practice group. I've been with the firm for 13 years now, and I've been practicing for about 21, 22 years. Next slide, please. So what we thought we'd do is give you a sort of a broad picture overview. Um, the highlights in here, the, the bolding are, are some of the main takeaways. Um, we're a bit unique, um, not even a bit, we're unique in the entire country. Um, no other state has these types of state standards. Um, there had been some discussion and request, um, principally through um, the, the labor groups for OSHA to develop some regular standards for dealing with COVID. After looking at it, uh, OSHA politely declined to do so and generally just referred everybody to CDC guidelines. Um, the Governor Northam didn't think that was uh, satisfactory and issued uh, as part of his executive order a directive for the Department of Labor um, to review and then adopt some mandatory state standards. Um, the you know purpose, which is at the bottom, the overall purpose is obviously a, a, an important one and a good one, which is the control prevention and, and mitigation of the spread of, of COVID-19. Um, and, and one of the things you'll also see is, is, is a reference to SARS-CoV-2. And they're, for purposes of this presentation, they're they're just just think of them as being the same. Um, and did a really good description of them yesterday. That uh, you know, if you think of of I'm going to get it up. And you 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 give it. You you said it better than so I could the, really do it. the way I analogize analogize it is if you'll recall, um, HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. So um, the SARS. CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19, but for non-medical people such as Neil and myself and probably everyone on this call, I think it's, it's safe just to think of the terms as synonymous. COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 are one and the same for our purposes. Yeah, and the, the regs talk about both and it is, otherwise it can be confusing, but I, I, I agree totally with Anne. If you just deem them to be synonymous, you get to the same place. Um, in terms of coverage, the sort of the main thing here is if, if you're working on a federal um, facility or enclave or working in a maritime environment, these aren't going to be applicable. But other than that, if you are within the Commonwealth of Virginia, where VOSH has coverage um, through its, its relationship with OSHA um, as qualifying, then it's going to be covered. So even if you are working on a federal facility, chances are um, your your main workplace or other job sites, because most of y'all work in a lot of different arenas, um, you're going to be covered. But you could have some places that that aren't. Um, we'll talk a little bit. The the, the it's supposed to be. Uh, interrelate with laws that are already in effect. Um, keep in mind, though, that if these are more strict, then these will govern. And then the other major thing we'll talk intermittently about is that the main difference between a CDC guidelines, which are the just act guidelines and aren't legally enforceable against anybody, because these have now been adopted as part of uh, Virginia's regulatory scheme, they are subject to enforcement, and that comes through Vosh. Um, and as we talked about earlier, um, while they are temporary, um, and, and the concept was these were going to be emergency regs to deal with the COVID pandemic that I think a lot of people thought would come and go, um, obviously hasn't happened as much. There's been some additional spiking in places, 
including Hampton Roads. Um, in response to that, Vosch has already published that it intends to um, go through the process of adopting these as permanent regulations. So um, it doesn't look like they're going anywhere. Next slide. So throughout our presentation, um, you'll see some slides that look like this. They have a white background and a few more graphics. So what we did um, is that Vosch has now developed what they're calling a COVID-19 resource page. Um, and you can get to it by going to the Department of Labor uh, website and then um, hitting on the different links. You got to go through a couple of steps to get there, but but you can do that. And we'll also um, provide you with uh, some information about the, the website um, in a little bit. But we put these in. These are part of a much larger presentation Vosch has developed. That's about 110 slides, and it's got a lot, a lot, a lot of information. Um, some of it uh, not the easiest to read, but it does have a few interesting ones that have some nice graphics and give some good summaries. So to give everybody an idea that one, that those slides were there on Vosch's website, and two, um, just sort of break down some of these a little bit differently. We've added those in throughout the presentation and Ann and I will talk about them at various uh, points in time, but you can distinguish those by seeing them. They'll have this white background with that top header, whereas the the ones that are uh, more ours have have more the the consistent blue rectangle at the uh, on the top along with the uh, gray heading that um, is more the slides that we put together. Next slide. This is sort of the big picture. These are what the regs uh, cover. Um, like most regulations, they start out with some definitions and they are very hard to read, but they are important. Um, we will give you some of the highlights of those. Then it breaks down to mandatory requirements for all employers, regardless of what you do um, employment wise or, or work wise. And we will talk about all of these. And then um, we're going to focus some on the specifics of what these regs do, which in part are to identify hazards and risk. Um, and we'll talk about those in the different categories. Then we will talk about um, the planning process, the training process, and then there is a uh, discriminant non discrimination piece that was built into the regulations that Anne in particular will talk through. Next slide. So the first thing that all employers need to do is to classify your employees according to their exposure level and the Bosch has laid out um, four different categories of risk. There's very high exposure risk, high exposure risk, medium and lower exposure risk and you have to classify each of your employees and it's really job based, not so much um, employee based. So you might have an employee who on some days is in the lower risk category, but on other days has tasks that put him into the medium risk category. And so his risk exposure level depends on what he's actually doing. And to undergo this assessment, this slide um, lists some of the factors you want to consider, but it's basically looking at what um, exposure risk they have to COVID. And a lot of it deals with how much contact they come into with um, other people. So I have found that for most businesses, your office employees, and I think this is probably going to be true for everyone on the phone, your office workers, because they are able to maintain social distance in most circumstances and aren't having a lot of exposure to people outside of the company, they're probably going to be lower risk, whereas the people on your job sites, because they often have to come within six feet of their coworkers to get the tasks accomplished and also have to interact with other people um, outside of your company, they probably will fall under the medium risk um, category. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. This slide just goes through some of the factors you wanna look at. So the work environment, whether it's indoors or outdoors, if you know or suspect that the virus or infected people are on the work site, and that should not come into play with um, your businesses, the number of employees or other people in relation to the size of the work area. So 
Um, you're going to look at that, the working distance between the employees and other people, and the duration and frequency of their exposure through contact with other individuals. Next slide, please. OK, so this um, slide talks a little bit more about the um, risk categories. Um, so as I mentioned, there's very high, high, medium and lower risk categories. The very high um, and high, I, I doubt you would have any employees under that. That's mainly going to be people like healthcare workers who are coming into contact with people who they know to be sick. Um, and that's probably not going to be anyone in your workplace. So let's just focus on medium. Medium is where the place of employment or the task requires more than minimal occupational contact inside six feet with other employees, other persons, or the general public. Um, so I think, again, that's where a lot of your field workers, your actual construction workers will probably fall. And then lower risk is where the place of employment or task has minimal occupational contact with other employees, other persons, or the general public, such as in an office building setting and the people are able to achieve minimal occupational contact through the implementation of engineering, administrative, and work practice control. Um, and it, once you categorize your employees or their job tasks based on risk, that's going to affect which aspects of the emergency temporary standards apply to those employees and what you have to do as an employer. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, once you categorize them, you're going to, um, in addition, some other things that you're going to have to do for all of your employees is you need to establish a system for them to self-assess and self-screen for signs of COVID. And you're basically going to be explaining to them, and I'm hoping that a lot of you have probably already done this, implemented a policy that you'll probably need to revise and update based on these standards, but you should already have a written policy that instructs your employees if you're sick, don't come to work. If you've been exposed, don't come to work. Notify the employer. Um, and so you want to have those procedures and keep the sick employees and people who've been um, exposed to COVID away from healthy employees. And then, of course, you also have to establish a return to work policy. And again, I'm hoping that most of you have already done that, but you might need to tweak them based on the new standards from Virginia. And this is just a little note I have down here at the bottom of the slide, and we'll talk about this a bit more later, but there are, as part of these new standards, restrictions on employers taking disciplinary or discharging or discriminating against employees for certain activities. And one of them is that employees are permitted to wear their own PPE or raise reasonable concerns about infection control. So if an employee wants to bring in additional PPE that's not really required by his job, you should generally permit him to do that unless you determine that that additional PPE he wants to wear interferes with his job or actually makes his job less safe. Um, but basically, you're going to give some leeway to employees in a lot of circumstances where they have reasonable concerns about what you're doing to prevent COVID in the workplace. Next slide, please. Um, so this again is talking about the exposure risk level and the assessment that you have to do. Um, and that in doing so, you're going to take into account all risks and all modes of transmission, including airborne transmission, and as well as transmission by asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic employees and individuals. Next slide, please. That's just a definition of high risk or very high risk. Um, again, I don't think you would have anyone in that category. Next slide, please. And these are just some um, factors and we include this information in here because we will make these slides available and this may be of interest to you but again i don't think you're going to have anyone in this category next slide please and this is a definition of the high risk next slide and these are some examples of high risk employees and again i don't think anyone on this phone call would have that next slide please um, some more examples of high risk people. So we're talking about, you know, EMTs, uh, first responders, people who work in mortuaries. Next slide, please. This is where most of you guys are going to going to fall, we think, um, or some combination, but certainly your folks out in the field and your uh, uh, when you're actually doing construction activities. Um, this is the next step down from very high or high. 
uh, and it is the medium exposure. Um, it's where uh, there's more than minimal occupational contact inside six feet with other employees, other persons, or the general public who may be infected with SARS-CoV-2, but who are not known or suspected to be infected with the virus. Um, medium exposure risk hazards or job tasks may include, but aren't limited to. Um, and normally I don't read slides, but I thought that one was an important one. Um, but they include, next slide please. You will see at the bottom uh, left hand side indoor and outdoor construction settings. Um, so that obviously is the bulk of um, of you guys and what you're doing. Um, next slide, please. There's a few other examples that Vosch believes are on the medium risk level side. Um, keep in mind, and we'll talk about how you, you evaluate risk, but um, a little bit more and talked about some. Um, no, but it's a case by case, job site by job site analysis. Uh, so it's not just everything we do is medium or everything we do some other risk category. Next slide, please. And then the next step down, so to speak, is the lower exposure. Um, and obviously each one of those is a little bit uh, less in terms of, of risk level, but um, since you're, you're, this is probably going to be most folks' home offices. Maybe some other particular job sites um, where you don't uh, evaluate it as being as high as a medium risk, uh, but this is sort of the other catch-all category, uh, and most other businesses, including, as I said, their home office, are going to fall into this exposure level. Um, there is a uh, matrix, so to speak, uh, a hazardous um, infectious risk assessment form that Vosch has put together recently. They published it um, either end of the last week, beginning of this week, and it's on their website. You can pull it down and it walks you through the analysis, at least that Vosch thinks you should be making, and it'll get you pretty much where you need to be on, on this, I think. Next slide, please. And there's just some additional information there's um, of, of, of the lower exposure analysis. And then one of the things we wanted to point out, the, the graphic on this particular slide is uh, out of the CDC guidelines, but it's available on the CDC website and Vosch has this and similar um, uh, downloads you can you can use so you don't have to reinvent the wheel on, on the information that you're publishing to your employees next slide please one of the terms that um is used throughout the new standards is face covering and i thought it was important just to talk about the definition of that so that you can understand the difference between it and a mask so the type of mask that most of us are wearing now when we go to the store those are technically referred to as face coverings because they're not surgical masks they haven't met niosh standards they're just something that you're putting over your face and that's going to still be useful under these new standards for most of your employees in most settings it's um, a face covering. It's normally made out of cloth or some other material. It covers the wearer's nose and mouth. And its purpose is not to protect the wearer. It doesn't protect the person who's wearing it, but it may help reduce the spread of the virus from the wearer to others. Um, so again, it's not a surgical or medical proceed, uh, mask um, at all. And it's not subject to testing by any state or government agency. Next slide, please. Um, PPE is different than face coverings. So face coverings would not be PPE because again, it doesn't protect the wearer. It's not a personal protective equipment. It's something to protect other people. So PPE protects the wearer and that's going to be equipment that's worn to minimize exposure to hazards that would cause injuries or illness. And 
that could be um, injuries or illness that would result from contact with chemical, radiological, physical, electrical, mechanical, biological, or other workplace hazards. So I'm sure you're very familiar with PE, PPE with um, your job sites and various things that your employees have to wear, like hard hats and um, steel-toed shoes and fall protection. And this is, um, those are actual PPE. And with regard to COVID, PPE would be um, actual goggles or face shields, um, N95 or higher respirators, um, certain types of gloves, isolation gowns. I don't think you'd have any reason to use that um, in your line of work, but the, that's what PPE is in the context of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So a respirator um, would be a protective device that, and this is a PPE for res res respirators are, it covers the nose and mouth or the entire face um, to guard against hazardous atmospheres. And respirators are certified by NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. There are two types of respirators. You have your tight fitting respirators and loose fitting. And then some respirators function to purify the air that the wearer is breathing and others actually provide clean air. Um, you have a, a, a source of air and that's usually for really hazardous exposures. Um, so you may not have anybody who has that at your workplace. Next slide, please. A um, little bit more about surgical masks. Uh, I don't think there'd be any reason for you to ever have one in your workplace, but this is just a definition for your informational purposes. Next slide, please. So this, the regs, the temporary regs, went into effect after they were uh, published formally on July 27th. So they're here now and they're in effect um, with the timelines for the training components we're going to talk about um, coming about in a 60 and 30 day time interval from the adoption. Um, and similarly, the plan um, requirement that we're going to talk about is a 60 day requirement. So these are the formal dates that are there. Um, when they first came out, I already talked about this briefly. They were, they're only supposed to be effective for six months. And the thought was, well, they'll just go away if COVID goes away. Um, but as it doesn't seem to be happening, it looks like they're they're minimally here for six months. And if adopted, uh, Bosch is looking to make these permanent uh, as of the first part of next year. We talked about them being enforceable now. Um, I think you know we're we're not sure how that's going to happen. My best guess um, is that what's going to happen is either a few businesses are going to be targeted either because of their size or because there's a perceived particular risk with what they're doing or something else is going to happen on a job site there'll be an inspector out there inspecting that other thing and then in conjunction with that um, they're going to want to discuss and evaluate your um, your COVID-19 uh, plans and how you're implementing the ETS and do you have any any thoughts on on what you see in your crystal ball with that yeah I, I completely agree with you and I think particularly for people on this call one of your um, risks, so to speak, in dealing with VOSH is just your visibility because you're on the road. And so the inspector driving to um, Starbucks is going to see you and, and want to pull over and look at your job site. And I think Neil's right. They're going to initially pull over for other reasons or be called to your job site for other reasons. But while they're there, they're going to be looking at this. Um, and as I'm sure some of you have experienced, when they show up, they tend to find something. And this is just one more thing for them to find. Yeah, Nick, Nick, hopefully they won't. They won't be too annoying about it. We'll see. <laughs> Next slide, please. So these are some of the mandatory requirements for all employers, regardless of what risk category your employees are in. You do need to, as I mentioned earlier, um, do your exposure assessment, determine which category people are in. Um, and you're going to need to inform your employees of how they're going to self-monitor and how they're going to report to you if they have COVID-19. You do need to have written policies and procedures for employees on how they're going to do that. Um, you need to designate um, a person in your workplace who's going to be the, the one in charge of the plan. Um, the the regulations call them, I, I believe it's a, a health monitor, I think is the name. I, I prefer something like um, COVID coordinator. Um, 
but you know, you're going to have someone who's going to be designated so your employees know who to contact. And when the employee does have symptoms, the regulations refer to them as a person suspected to be infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's something you'll see in the standards. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you want to have a policy that's going to prohibit anyone who is suspected or known to be infected from coming to the work site or engaging um, with a customer or client until the person has been cleared to return to work. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what's going to be required for someone to come back. Another aspect, and this ties into some of the other legislation that's come out of the whole coronavirus um, crisis, is you want to take a look at your leave policies. The standards that Virginia has adopted specifically direct empl employers that to the extent feasible and to the extent permitted by law, they need to have sick leave policies that are flexible um, and that's to allow employees to take off time when they can. And a big part of that, of course, is making sure you are complying with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which is the federal law that requires you to provide paid leave to employees in certain circumstances related to COVID. So you want to make sure you have up those notices and that you're applying that law correctly. And then with regard to your other existing sick leave policies, if you have them and you're not generally required to, or at least most employers aren't required to, you want to just take a look and make sure you're as flexible as you can be with that so that employees um, are not disincentivized to uh, stay home when they should. Next slide, please. So there's some additional components to that as well. Um, and you know, just to highlight a few, um, one of the things that makes this unusual um, in some ways is the top bullet, which puts upon you obligations to communicate not just with your own employees, but also subcontractors and companies providing contractor temp employees um, or that may have come onto your job site otherwise or into your your home office and potentially been subjected to exposure. Um, so and then the, the bullet, second bullet, um, we included that in part to show the push pull that's here. You know, and, and they use this phrase in the regs in different locations to the extent permitted by law, including HIPAA. Well, that's, that's tough. It puts burden on you guys to sort of know what those other laws are, which you know, ideally you're supposed to know anyway, but you know, when can you make disclosures? When can't you? Those are going to become some pitfalls that folks are going to need to work through because if you do have a known or perceived um, suspected exposure, it places upon you numerous um, notification requirements, the bulk of which we've identified here. So that again, that includes your own folks, um, it includes others um, who may have been on your job site, their, their employers, um, so that they can then make the notifications to their employees. If you happen to also own or manage the building you're located in, then and there's other tenants, you've got obligations there. And then, uh, of course, to the Department of Health and to Vosh, because they all want to be in the mix. And you know, the question is, once they get the notifications, what do they do with them um, other than track them? Uh, and, and we don't know for sure yet uh, but I don't say that that there's likely to be anything nefarious associated with it but just you know awareness that um, this is something that is, is a public record and people will will know about and you know depending on on what the exposures are um, you know if you're a hot spot for example you pretty much guarantee you're probably going to get some focus from the government Next slide. Um, as Neil was mentioning, there are other laws you need to be aware of, and one of them is the ADA. And under the ADA, you have to protect employees' privacy of their medical records. And that's why if you have medical records of, regarding one of your employees, you're supposed to store it in a location other than the personnel file. And you're supposed to restrict access to that um, to those medical records but under the standards you have to make sure that the employee has access to his or her own exposure related records and medical records you have to make sure they have that another aspect of ada that you need to be aware of with regard to all this is 
if you do have someone who has tested positive and you're um, doing all the things Neil talked about in the last slide, notifying everyone you're supposed to notify, you have to protect the privacy of the individual who has tested positive. So you're not supposed to tell your other employees who tested positive. Um, they probably will figure it out. You know, you'll say someone tested positive and they'll look around and Jack's the only person not at work today, must be Jack, but you don't confirm that even though they can probably guess it. Um, and so another aspect of this is the standards specifically um, say that employers should not be using serological testing and making any COVID related decisions. I doubt any of you would be inclined to do that anyway, but just so you know, the standards specifically prohibit it um, because that testing is not considered to be accurate yet. And that would be blood testing that's looking for antibodies. Next slide, please. So the return to work requirements. Um, this is an interesting um, aspect of the standards because the timing was bad for the Virginia Department of Labor and Industry. They issued their standards uh, the same week that the CDC revised its guidance. So we now have the standards setting forth requirements for return to work that conflict with CDC. And I think the most prudent thing for employers to do would be to hew to the more conservative side, um, the safer side, and I think you're going to be fine. And the standards do say that if you're complying in good faith with the CDC, it's considered to be compliant with the standards. So this is a place where we have some differences. The standards say that you need to develop and implement either a symptom-based or test-based strategy for returning to work people who either you are known to or suspect it to be um, have COVID and they, they have symptoms. These are your symptom-based and um, symptom symptomatic employees. You have to have either a symptom-based or test-based strategy for returning them to work. Well, the CDC, the same week this came out, said don't use test-based strategies. Scrap the test-based strategies. Apparently, the CDC doesn't believe that the tests are reliable um, for determining whether someone is still contagious. So if someone is symptomatic, um, the CDC is saying that you shouldn't allow them back until a time-based um, strategy has been satisfied. So the, the time-based strategy in the standards also differs from the time-based strategy with the CDC because the CDC revised its time-based strategy at the same time. So the time-based strategy in the standards is that you need to wait um, until the employee has uh, been symptom-free or I'm sorry, fever free without using medicines to reduce fever for at least 72 hours and that at least 10 days have passed since the first symptoms. That's the standards test for the time-based strategy. I would recommend that's the one that you follow because it's more conservative than the CDC time-based strategy, which is now saying that you have to wait until 24 hours have passed since the fever has been, um, since the employee has stopped having a fever and at least 10 days since the first symptoms. So again, here I think it makes sense to follow the Virginia standards time-based strategy of the th minimum of three days or 72 hours of passage since recovery from the fever without using fever reducing medicine or end at least 10 days have passed since the first symptoms. That should be an and there. Um, and then we do have a definition there of the test-based strategy, but again, given that the CDC has said not to use that anymore, I don't think it would be wise for you to do that. You can go to the next slide, please. You also need to have a return to work standard for employees who you know to be infected but never develop symptoms. There are quite a few people who have COVID-19 test positive but they never develop symptoms. So the standards say use a time-based or test-based strategy. Again, the CDC says don't use test-based strategy. The time-based strategy for both the CDC and the Virginia standards is that a minimum of 10 days have passed since the first diagnostic test, um, the first test of positive, assuming that the person never developed symptoms. So that's how you should treat people who are asymptomatic. Next slide, please. So we're going to go through fairly quickly. There, there are some mandatory requirements that apply to all employers, regardless of the risk category, um, and particularly in your your home offices. Here, we're all used to the social distancing catchphrase. Um, Vosh uses a slightly different physical distancing, but it's effectively the same requirement. Um, you know, and there are as we expect most of you guys already have a lot of these in place, but 
um, for common areas, break rooms and lunch rooms, you need to have closed or controlled access and put some per proper protections into place, most of which make common sense. Um, one thing to point out, uh, the note at the very bottom, um, almost all of us have hand sanitizer all over the place. Um, it is, generally speaking, uh, a flammable material, though, depending on who made it and what it's made of. Uh, but if it has the typical um, ingredients in it, it's going to be flammable, which requires you to use and store it appropriately. Um, and if you do get a unexpected Vosch um, inspection, that's certainly an easy one for them to uh, pick up on and um, you know, if if you don't have that simple thing, so to speak, squared away, then it may suggest that they roll their sleeves up a little bit or even vice versa. If you show them like, you know, hey, that is something we've dealt with, um, maybe they, they think the opposite and um, give you a little bit more break on other things as they uh, you know, as Ann noted, you can you can get as nitpicky as an inspector almost as you want to. Next slide, please. So um, one aspect of the standards that I found kind of cryptic and a little confusing, I think <laughs> this is just kind of a general complaint about the standards. I think they were rushed through and I don't think that they necessarily thought out all the aspects of them, but they have a provision in there that if you have employees, multiple employees occupying a vehicle for work purposes, then they need to comply with the respiratory protection and PPE standards applicable to the industry. I'm not aware of any respiratory protection or PPE standards that apply to people in cars. Um, so I'm not really sure what they mean there, but I think they would be compliant when you do have multiple employees occupying a vehicle um, on the job site or for work purposes to just require them all to wear face coverings. And again, that would not be the respirators. That would be just a standard face covering like we're all wearing to the grocery store now. Um, the other, some other things in the standards, you have to comply with all the applicable Virginia executive orders, any order of public health emergency. Um, if the employees work or the work area doesn't allow for the physical distancing, the six feet distancing, and when you can't put in place other types of controls to prevent transmission of um, airborne particles, then you want to have employees wearing respiratory protection and PPE applicable to the industry. And again, there isn't any PPE um, standard or respiratory protection in, in many circumstances, depending on the type of work you're doing. And if there is none, then you would want your employees to wear face coverings. You also have to comply with the sanitation and disinfection requirements. You can go to the next slide, please. And like everything else, there are exceptions. The the one we expect um, folks will see intermittently um, or is somebody saying, hey, uh, I can't do that because it would be um, less uh, helpful for me, less healthy because I have some other um, underlying health or, or safety or medical condition of some sort. Those are things you'll have to work through. At the end of the day, the, the note is, that um, you still have an obligation to make sure they are safe. So you have to do that within the constructs of whatever their medical condition is. There's also a religious waiver, but I expect it's not gonna be um, used a lot, but if it is, just keep in mind that it is there and there is a process that is put in place, including going all the way up through um, consultation with the attorney general's office. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you have to make sure you have cleaning and disinfection um, performed in your workplace on a regular basis. And as part of that, you have to make sure you have cleaning and disinfecting products available to your employees so they can take care of that. Um, you're supposed to make sure those products are only those approved by the EPA under list in for use against the virus and viral pathogens. And there's a link there to the website where you can get a list of those um, chemicals and you have to obviously follow the manufacturer's instructions for using those chemicals and disinfecting products. Next slide please. We'll go through this series. They're, they're all similar. Um, the point here is that depending on your category of risk there are 
these three things that come into play that need to be evaluated. Number one, engineering controls. What's in place um, from an engineering standpoint that can help with the reduction um, of, of, of exposure or spread? Number two is what administrative and work practice controls can you as the employer put into place to alleviate um, conditions? And three is the use of PPE. Um, one point on that last is Vosch has come up with a, uh, a new position um, just that came out that made it very clear that regardless of your analysis, PPE can never be the single um, basis upon which you rely for the control of exposure or, or risk of, of spread. It has to be in conjunction with the engineering controls or the practice controls. Next slide. Similar for medium, of course, as we talked about, this is where most of you guys are, are going to be out in the field at least. Next slide. Uh, and here's a big piece of a major heart of this um, process is, yeah, you need to evaluate your risk, but then what do you do with it? And Vosch's answer to that is a infectious disease preparedness and response plan has to be prepared within minimum of 60 days from the adoption of the regs. Um, we are suggesting that folks put something in place more quickly if they can and then they can see how it works and adjust and fire uh, after that. Um, it is mandatory for very high and high risk. Um, and then for medium with 11 or more employees, and that is employees total, not just those that you think may have a medium exposure. At least that's the way we, we are interpreting it. Um, component to this, Ann talked about it a little bit, but there is now a designated individual or individuals that are responsible for implementing and enforcing the plan and ensuring that there are there's training on it. Vosh, um, despite not being in the regs, are calling those people, they gave them the moniker as health officers. I guess it's as good as anything else. Um, so that's the terminology that is out there. Vosh has a uh, template that they've put on the website. Um, Ann and I have both looked at it. And um, you know, what, are, what are your thoughts, Ann? I'll let you grab I, that. I think that they went overboard in their template. I think that it actually conflicts with the standards in, in some places, and it goes far beyond what the standards require. For example, there is a provision in there where you're supposed to ask your medium risk workers before they begin work each day whether they've taken an airplane flight recently. I don't know where they came up with that. It's not in the standards. Um, I don't recommend using the plan that they came up with. I think it's confusing and overly burdensome, and it doesn't meet, It's it goes far beyond what's required in the standards, I believe. Yeah, I, I agree. Here, here's the the basic requirements that are in the regs, um, and and as Ann said, they went beyond that with their template. Um, the other point here is keep in mind that one of the requirements is that your employees have to be involved in the development uh, of the plan. Um, how you do that isn't specified in the regulations, and so it's up to you as individual employers. One suggestion is to utilize what I refer to as a bottoms up approach where you bring in multiple employees at the lower levels and ask them how they see this happening, what they'd be comfortable with, and then build it into, into your plan rather than just um, developing it and tell everybody, hey, this is, uh, this is the plan, follow it. Next slide. And then the next step of that is of course training. Um, takeaway here is that the training is required for all of your employees, not just those that may be in a particular list risk classification. So you need to figure out how you're going to train everyone um, pretty much in your in your uh, your system to make it work. Um, the training requirements are there specified mandatory ones that we've identified here. 
but essentially it's teaching your employees about your plan, I think is the sort of the easy way to characterize it. Next slide. Uh, as part of that, you're going to need to maintain certification training records um, so you can show that you provided the training to the people that needed it. Um, and there is a specific retraining requirement that is in the regulatory scheme of uh, if you have reason to believe somebody didn't understand the training, i.e. they're out at a job site doing something stupid that is contrary to your plan, you need to retrain them. Um, you know, so that's a ongoing process uh, of, of how you implement your plan for your different employees and then retraining them on an as needed basis or as their risk may change or something is different about a particular job site. There's there's a lot of uh, some, some new information that Vosh has published on their website to help with that. There's some toolbox um, materials. There's uh, you know uh, a couple other things, including what they're calling nine steps to compliance that is available and it's in multiple languages um, as well, including Spanish. Next slide. They are requiring that the training address PPE, you know, just some of the basics about PPE when required, how to use it, those types of things. And also that you address heat related illnesses, um, which is probably a good idea this time of year anyway, that you also have to include in the training, the anti-discrimination provisions of the standards. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about those in, an, in another slide. And you also of course have to teach them in the training about your infectious disease preparedness and response plan. Next slide, please. So these are the dates of when you have to have the training done. Um, so as Neil mentioned earlier, you have a little bit of time here. We would recommend that you try to get it done sooner rather than later, but um, the infectious disease and preparedness response plan, those training requirements um, take effect within 30 days. Um, so it'd be by August 26th. Next slide, please. You need to have a certification that um, you've complied with these training requirements. And what I would recommend is that when the employees take the training that you log them in, that you have them sign in that they were there for the training. And then that would um, assist you in defending yourself that you had commit, had conducted the training. Next slide, please. Um, and if you're having another employer conduct the training for your employees, then you want to make sure that that's included in the records that you're keeping. Next slide, please. This is just an example of a certificate that you can use, a certificate of attendance that someone has been trained. Next slide, please. And then this, I think, is, is far more important. And th these are the anti-discrimination provisions. And some of this is very similar to what we've had all along for um, safety. You can't um, discharge or discriminate against any employee because they've exercised their rights under self safety and health standards, including these standards. Um, you also can't take any action against someone, as I mentioned earlier, who voluntarily wants to wear their own PPE. And one of the questions that we got, and I can go ahead and publish it during this presentation, is there is a question about if someone chooses to use a N95 respirator on a job site, and if, if that's not a requirement of the job, does it have to be, do you have to do a fit test? So if they would not normally need to wear a respirator to perform their job, but for some reason they've chosen to wear one, I don't believe you would have any obligation to perform a fit test because it's not required for the job. The fit test requirements, I believe, would only apply if the job actually required an N95 respirator. Neil, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, I, I agree. It's not required. You don't have to do it. I, I, I think at the end of the day, though, it, you know, if they're going to wear it, they, they, they probably should know how to wear it correctly, um, mm. or else it doesn't really do anything. That's a good point. Or, That's a very or good point. Put other people at risk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then some other aspects of the non-discrimination provision that may be a bit of a surprise to you is if an employee is raising a reasonable concern about whatever steps you're taking to prevent the spread of coronavirus in the workplace, 
you can't take any action against them for that if it's a reasonable concern. And similarly, if an employee refuses to work or enter a location that the employee feels is unsafe, you're not supposed to discharge or discipline them. Now, that again has to be a reasonable fear. So I've had some clients with employees who have just said, I'm not coming in because I think it's unsafe. When that happens, you should be asking the employee, why do you think it's unsafe? Explain to me what your issues are here um, and, and try to address them. And if at the end of the day, the employee is just being unreasonable, you would be okay to discipline them. But you do want to go through that process first. And just one other thing I want to mention about this discrimination provision, it includes specifically that you can't take any action against them for um, complaining about your uh, infectious infection control plan on social media. So if they are taking to other sites to like Facebook or whatever to complain about how you're addressing COVID, if they're raising any type of reasonable concern, you can't take any action against them for that. Next slide, please. So um, as we talked about, VOSH has some consultation services that are available, um, free, confidential, um, on-site or virtual. And here's where that information is. Um, if, if, as I said earlier, if you go to that www.doli.virginia.gov, um, you can uh, narrow down into the COVID resources webpage that VOSH has. And then if you drone down even further, you can find there's um, an outreach uh, so to speak, program that is there that has the training template, um, the certification forms, a lot of the things that we've been we've been talking about. Next slide, please. So um, it's a formal question and answer place here. Um, we we don't have any sitting in the Q and A queue um, while we wait in a few minutes and see if anybody push anything in there and um, any concluding thoughts on the ETS and where you see uh, employers wanting to focus? Um, sure, so I, I do think that you should take some time to look over the resources that the Department of Labor and Industry has made available on its website, but take it all with a grain of salt. They do have a PowerPoint presentation that you can use for training your employees. I don't recommend it. It's very unwieldy. It's more than 100 slides and it includes a ton of information that your employees don't need to hear and it will put them to sleep. And as we mentioned earlier, their template plan is over the top. So take it all with a grain of salt. The controlling document are the standards themselves and that's where you should start. And of course, we're available to assist any businesses that have um, want some assistance in putting together their plan and doing their training. Okay, um, no questions, next next slide. So that pretty much wraps it up from us. Um, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to do this. Um, our firm um, and in particular and Ray King on the um, the money side of, of what the government is offering offering um, have been really focusing on information available about COVID-19. Um, we have a ton of stuff that's on our website uh, at www.vanblacklaw.com um, and uh, anybody certainly is is welcome to go there or reach out at any time to me or to Ann. Um, and at that, I'll turn it over to Ann and then we'll turn it over to Stephanie for any concluding thoughts she has. Thanks everybody, I appreciate you tuning in today. Stephanie, anything you wanna throw in? I uh, just wanna thank everyone and thank you for your efforts, uh, Neil and Ann. Um, for doing this for us. Um, it's been very informative and if there's anything I can pass along to the members, uh, just let me know if you get additional questions or anything you'd like me to post on our website as well. Great, we will do that. We being our marketing director, Kristen. <laughs> 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 so thank you guys, everybody. Uh, hope everybody has a great, uh, great day. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.